Hi, everyone. Welcome and good afternoon. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I'm so excited to introduce this virtual event with Nick Lane discussing his book, Transformer, The Deep Chemistry of Life and Death, in conversation with Logan McCarty. Thank you for joining us virtually. Today's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. In just a few days on Monday, October 3rd, award-winning historian of science Jurgen Wren will join us for a discussion of his latest book, The Evolution of Knowledge, Rethinking Science for the Anthropocene in conversation with Manfred Lobique. And on October 12th, Temple Grandin will join us at the Harvard Science Center for an in-person presentation of her latest book, Visual Thinking, The Hidden Gifts of People Who Think in Pictures, Patterns, and Abstractions. This afternoon's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our authors at any time during the talk today, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. Finally, in the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase Transformer on harvard.com. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University, and thank you all for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science. We're very grateful for your support. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Nick Lane is Professor of Evolutionary Biochemistry at University College London and co-director of the UCL Center for Life's Origins and Evolution. Professor Lane has published more than 100 papers in top journals, including Science, Nature, and PNAS, and is he is best known for his five books on evolution, including The Vital Question, Energy, Evolution, and the Origins of Complex Life. Today, he is joining conversation by Logan McCarty, Assistant Dean of Science Undergraduate Education, lecturer on chemistry and chemical biology, and lecturer on physics at Harvard University. With colleagues from the biology and physics departments, Dr. McCarty created and co-teaches a topical Harvard general education course entitled, What is Life? From Quarks to Consciousness. This afternoon, Nick and Logan have joined us for a discussion of Transformer, a book which Joseph Moran calls a thrilling tour of the remarkable stories behind the discoveries of some of life's key metabolic pathways and mechanisms. Lane lays bare the human side of science. The book brings to life the chemistry that brings us to life. I'll end with final praise from Siddhartha McCurdy, who calls Transformer a compulsively readable book. Lane takes us on a riveting journey, ranging from the flow of energy to new ways of understanding cancer. We've got a lot to learn this afternoon. So without further ado, I am delighted to turn things over to our speakers today. The digital podium is all yours, Nick and Logan. Well, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Yes, thanks, Benjamin. Um, so Nick, uh, I really enjoyed uh, reading your book. Um, I I, I felt like I was sort of reading three books all <laughs> together. And, um, and one of them was, you know, one of them was kind of the biochemistry book that I wish I had had. <laughs> sort of a, 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 Me a too, presentation, a, a, a maybe somewhat unorthodox presentation of some of the key, you know, biochemical pathways, you know, obviously focusing on the, on the Krebs um, cycle. If you don't mind, I want to just, um, so in my, um, when I was in graduate school, my lab had this poster on the wall, which I'm sure you will immediately recognize. So this is a poster of biochemical mm. pathways. And right in the middle here is the Krebs cycle. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about like, what is this Krebs cycle and how is this a central? Yeah, um, so, um... <laughs> <laughs> These metabolic maps are terrifying, I think, for most people who's not a biochemist. And actually, frankly, even for biochemists, they're pretty <laughs> scary things. And uh, when, when I, so I was doing my uh, degree in biochemistry back in the, in the 1980s, uh, and they were a bit simpler in those days. Uh, not that much simpler, but still. Um, and, and the Krebs cycle kind of sits right at the heart of all of this, and it's a, it's a, it's a circle. And uh, very little else is cyclic in, in, in biology or biochemistry. Um, so it, it kind of stands out as something unusual in, in biochemistry. And then there's the story of Hans Krebs himself and the discovery of it, which was early years of biochemistry. And, and, and uh, the first time that people managed to 
figure out what was happening in living tissues. I mean, what the Krebs cycle is doing really is, is um, burning food, I suppose, is the simplest way of putting it. It's stripping out carbon dioxide from food molecules and hydrogen, and then the hydrogen's being fed to oxygen and burned in oxygen. Uh, and that's essentially what the Krebs cycle is doing. But why is it a cycle? Um, it, it's, a, it's a whole series of rather finickety looking reactions that, that uh, there's something intriguing about them, but at the same time, they don't really seem to make much sense. Now, this was put together by, by Hans Krebs in the 1930s. And, and you have to think about very thin slices of tissue, like uh, pigeon breast muscle, for example. And it will be measuring gases that were being um, released, so, so CO2, for example, and the consumption of oxygen, and trying to work out from this, what on earth is going on with respiration? What is it that keeps us alive? Mm -hmm. And it's such fascinating biochemistry. It's so hard now when we have so many fancy techniques to, to kind of grasp, you know, you, I think most people could imagine you're faced with a bit of tissue and, and you, you, you're told, figure out how it works. <laughs> what on earth are you going to do? And so this was the kind of the wild west of biochemistry in the early days of, 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 of just figuring out what are all these molecules, how are they related to each other? And it's all invisible and still it's invisible. So it's excite it's an exciting story about one of the most, important things in all of life and and um yeah that's what it's doing right at the very heart of biochemistry as a, as a cycle it's uh, it really is the heart of biochemistry is what's keeping us alive right you had it, it, it's fascinating to me as a as a student when i first learned the krebs cycle which i think was in high school i you know i learned it just as this cycle that produces essentially consumes food and produces ultimately produces atp right yeah and um you know, then, but you had a wonderful description of this in your book, which actually fits sort of with that crazy map that I just showed, where it's not just that one cycle operating in isolation, but it's almost a, you called it a roundabout. In Massachusetts, we'd call it a traffic rotary, where you actually <laughs> right, have, right. you actually have lots of things kind of coming in, going around the cycle, going out, coming, you know, yep, participating yep. in other kinds of reactions. There, there, there's a lot more, um, you mentioned in the book that you, even coming into this as a biochemist, writing this book made you appreciate even more the role of the Krebs cycle and its centrality in biology. So tell me, what does that mean? You know, this yes. thing is already right at the middle of that map, okay? So yeah, how can it yeah, be even yeah. more, you know? Well, I mean, I suppose the, the, the first, the first thing is which, which a lot of people, even biochemists don't appreciate even today, is that a lot of bacteria do exactly the opposite of, of what we are doing with it. So I said it, it it's stripping out hydrogen and CO2 from food molecules, effectively from, from short uh, carbon skeletons, in effect, these Krebs cycle intermediates, they're basically composed of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen, and that's it. Um, and what these bacteria are doing is the opposite. They, they are um, taking carbon dioxide and hydrogen from, from the environment, uh, and, and, and kind of cobbling them together and, and converting them into the same Krebs cycle intermediates. They, this is basically the, the hand of cards that you have as, uh, as, as carbon-based life. Um, so, so I say it's at the heart of metabolism. It's not only the metabolism of burning things to generate energy, it's also the metabolism of turning gases in the environment into living things, which is extraordinary. And, and somehow, because there's not much connection across the scope of biology between the people who work on bacteria in hydrothermal vents at one end and the people who are working mm -hmm. on Krebs cycle dysfunction in cancer or something at the other end. Um, the book seemed a wonderful way of trying to bring them together uh, and, and look uh, for me, uh, uh, well, how do you? Because you've got these two opposite, <laughs> opposite directions of the cycle going on. One works really well in the absence of oxygen. You can, you can turn hydrogen and CO2 into, into living molecules, if you like, in the strict absence of oxygen at the very early years of the planet. And now it, it's, it's very hard to do that, but it seems that in cancer, um, often the cycle is going partly backwards. Uh, yeah. and, and you know what do cancer cells want to do? They want to make copies of themselves. That means you need to make more DNA, you need to make more proteins, you need to make more of the, the lipids for the membranes and so on. Um, so you need more building blocks, basically, and, and those building blocks are coming from the Krebs cycles effectively spinning in reverse. So how do you reconcile those? You, you, you talked about the, the roundabout, or uh, I've already forgotten the, the Massachusetts term, term but uh, it's, uh, you know, you have traffic coming in and going out at pretty much everywhere, and it can be going in two different directions through, through, through this. It's, it's really not a cycle. It's quite a mess. 
Right. Yeah, that that reminds me of being in Australia, renting a car and promptly driving the wrong direction around an Australian <laughs> um, roundabout. So yeah. um, you you mentioned Krebs and some of these amazing early experiments, which which you know it's almost hard to fathom being able to determine anything from the primitive techniques that they had available. Yeah. Um, and that makes me that brings me to sort of the second book that I felt like I was reading, which was really a vivid narrative history of some of these key discoveries in biochemistry, um, both, you know, people, scientists, and some of these mm. experiments. And I was wondering, as you were doing research for this, was there a, was, was there some key experiment that you discovered that you hadn't appreciated beforehand, and that you would, you know, tell us like, oh, wow, this one experiment was just so elegant. What would that, what would that be? Um, I think, you had to actually, pick one. yes. Um, <laughs> Well, there's there's one that I, I I highlight. It's actually not to do with the Krebs cycle, but it's to do with Krebs's own mentor Otto Warburg, uh, and and um, he just had this amazing, beautiful experiment um, where he he was trying to work out what was happening in respiration, and this was the inspiration that really got Krebs himself going. Um, and, and what what is the is the enzyme or the catalyst which is which is responsible for transferring the hydrogen onto onto oxygen to form water so water is one of the waste products from 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 respiration um, and what he realized was that carbon monoxide will inhibit respiration it will bind to this enzyme and, and prevent respiration and so in these tissue slices he was able to to, uh, to effectively gas them with carbon monoxide uh, and it would it would prevent any consumption of oxygen at all. And he he was he was using a, a manometer, which is uh, for measuring the pressure of gases. Um, and and then he would shine lights of particular wavelengths at it. So you could use a mercury lamp, for example, or you could burn sodium. And all these you know this is very this makes you realize how old it is. Um, so the so the light produced would be of a specific wavelength. And if the enzyme absorbed at that particular wavelength, it would tend to dissociate the carbon monoxide from it and then start working again. And different wavelengths of light worked, some worked better than others. And, and so he was able to kind of reconstitute a spectrum for the enzyme, which turned out to be a heme program, a protein like hemoglobin. And so he realized that it's not just the heme in hemoglobin, it's also really linked into respiration as well. And it's just such a beautiful experiment that kind of with really simple methods pulls out one particular enzyme which is responsible for the transfer of hydrogen onto oxygen in in, in respiration and it's you know it's, it's very very clever right and what uh, about what was this was this in the 20s what was the period of this that um, was in the 20s yes yeah. yeah okay yeah and and fascinating that of course using using um using light to to carry out chemical reactions like that this is really primitive quantum mechanics of course at the at that time Absolutely, right so yes in, in yeah. a way that's you know using some of what at the time was cutting edge physics really to explore the biology and the metabolism here and um, and warburg was the son of a physicist and uh, really prided himself on his physics he wasn't a physicist himself but a lot of these right. were basically experiments in biophysics and well well ahead of their time right right now that's fascinating um did you come across a, a scientist, a person that you hadn't appreciated before you did research for this book that just, you know, a, a story of an individual who maybe made an unheralded contribution? Um, I would, well, several, I wouldn't describe them as quite unheralded, but um, there are several women in, in the history of 20th century biology who are kind of known among a few people, but I think should be household names, practically. Mm -hmm. um, so one of them is Margaret Dayhoff. Uh, so we're, we're now a little bit, uh, a little bit more into the, into the 1950s, 1960s, and, and, and uh, a little later than that. But she, um, she was really the founder of bioinformatics, the idea of comparing mm. gene sequences to try to work out uh, the evolutionary history of things to build a tree of life, and she was the first person who really did that on on a on a on a grand scale. So um, Linus Pauling had done something separating, um, I think, uh, chimps from humans, uh, or, or maybe he was looking at horses as well. But you know, re relatively recent animals. Whereas, yeah. whereas uh, what Margaret Dayhoff was doing was reconstructing the whole evolutionary history of life. 
uh, going mm. right back to the very first bacteria, the scale of her accomplishment was extraordinary. And, and she basically founded this entire field of comparing gene sequences. So it was wonderful finding out more about her. There's another um, brilliant woman uh, pioneer, uh, Marjorie Stevenson. Uh, and she was in Cambridge in the 1930s. She died very early of breast cancer when she was in her 40s, I think. Maybe she was mm. about just 50. Um, and, and she had, I mean, she did amazing work herself and, and wrote a famous textbook, which is still in print um, <laughs> uh, on, on microbiology. Uh, and, um, but, but she also uh, had, had spotted that um, two young people who were working in her lab at the time, Peter Mitchell and Jennifer Moyle, uh, were kind of made for each other scientifically and she she kind of introduced them and, and 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 suggested that they should work together and Mitchell himself who I've written about on many occasions before um, was the pioneer of how, how energy works in cells and it's really all about electrical charges on the membranes driving everything driving mm -hmm. ATP synthesis for example um, so I, I'd written about Mitchell before and knew quite a lot about him uh, but I didn't know about Marjorie Stevenson, and I, I didn't know either very much about Jennifer Moyle, uh, who's another unsung hero of science, heroine of science. Um, she did all the experiments that really nailed Mitchell's theory. And Mitchell hmm. was a brilliant thinker, but he wasn't much, he wasn't that great in the lab. Um, yeah. and, and I don't think she got nearly as much credit as she deserved. And it's 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 kind of distressing reading this now because it seems so patently unfair right um, so it's one of the things that I wanted to do in the book is to try and bring some of these characters back to life in a way and 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 uh, and, and, and pay a tribute to some of the pioneers and try and try and redress that balance a little bit right um, there's a the, the the third book that I felt like I was reading which was mm. a little bit more hidden under the surface mentioned in the footnotes and things was sort of built on what you were just saying which is um, a kind of a running commentary on kind of the structure of science and how scientific institutions and and institutional factors kind of determine what science gets done and how science gets mm. promoted and what gets published. Um, and there's a sense in this book that that perhaps we went a little bit too far in biology emphasizing information, genetics and structure and that metabolism sort of got lost, you know, on, along the way. But I was wondering sort of you know, like, what are factors that 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 led to this? You know, um, in in science, and are there things that you know, if you could wave a magic wand and change some scientific institutions or practices, what would you, what would you do? Uh, I mean, a lot of these problems are pretty hard to fix in one way or another yeah. and I'm all in favor of scientific freedom and trying to give people as much freedom as possible. I think one of the most important. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know to what extent the scientific method in inverted commas exists at all, but but there 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 are. I mean, I, almost anything goes. But I think that there are. Um, it, 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 it's it's an aspiration, and I think that's what I would. That's what I try to 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 um, to bring to my own students anyway. Is is to try to be objective and to try to seek the truth and to try to be the first person to say you're wrong. Um, I think it's important personally to test hypotheses, um, but I think it's very easy to, you know, dedicate years or decades of your life to a particular hypothesis and then become very reluctant to let go when it's clear mm. to everybody else that it was wrong. And this, you know, I, I narrate a few stories along those lines in, in the book that there are, you know, brilliant characters, but very often arrogant um, and, and you know, I, I wondered once a, a few years ago now, what does it take to be remembered as a great scientist? And, and mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking specifically about people like Peter Mitchell and Lynn Margulis. Um, mm -hmm. And both of them were right about one really important thing. And mm -hmm. they were both wrong about an awful lot. <laughs> um, kind of wrong about far more than they were right about. And you would say, you know, you could say the same thing about Francis Crick or, or almost anybody mm -hmm. else. They were right about something really big and really important. They were brilliant thinkers, but they were wrong about an awful lot. And I think it's very good to keep this in mind because 
I mean, apart from anything else, it's, it's encouraging because it means even right. even the greats are not right about everything. So that's good. Um, but but it's really important to, you know, if they're wrong about things, then for sure I'm wrong about an awful lot. So uh, it's it, I think it's a healthy attitude that science tries to inculcate. Um, and, and, and another attitude that I think science tries to inculcate is, is to challenge authority all the time and not to have mm -hmm. deep hierarchies and not to not to be over judgmental of, uh, of people from from their position. And all of these things, I, I think, are should be part of the fabric of society, it should be part of how science works, often are not. But the aspiration is, a, is an important human aspiration to try to do these things better. Yeah, so one of these, uh, um, I think you actually called it a dogma that that you that you um, point out in the book is is a question about the origin of cancer and that cancer arises from you know mistakes in the in the genome mm. that then lead rise to unchecked growth. So tell us a little bit about you know why why was that the why is that developed into kind of the conventional story and then and then what do you what arguments do you make that that might not be the entire thing and that some yeah. of these metabolic challenges could be more important. So how did it come to be that way? And you, you also asked uh, earlier on about um, why did this kind of metabolic ideas in biology, yeah. why did they fade and become replaced by effectively an information centric view? Um, I, I mean, it's, genes are obviously important. I'm not, uh, and we've learned huge amounts about the world from, from, from comparing gene sequences. But uh, very often science will do what it can do. And, and in, in a way, gene sequencing provides you with massive amounts of information. Um, it, it provides you with a, with a kind of technological incentive of getting better at doing all this sequencing. And buried underneath it, there's a couple of assumptions that you couldn't really even grace with the word hypothesis. It's, it's really that everything is controlled by genes and that everything, you know, that, that the structure of cells is determined by genes, the structure of organisms is determined by genes and so on. And that's never been proved and not really known in any way. You know, you wouldn't be able to look at a genome and predict what kind of an organism it encoded. You're really short of comparing with another genome. There's nothing in genes that tell you that this is going to be a bacterium or, or, a, or, or, or an elephant, except unless you know what you're comparing it with. Uh, right. So, so it's, we simply don't know. Um, we don't know where the, the spatial um, uh, kind of coding comes in with the genome. It doesn't really. It comes in with cells. It comes, you know, the, 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 there's more to biology than genes. Now, the same thing goes for cancer. It's it's kind of, I won't say it's lazy, but it's easy to sequence everything, sequence cancer cells, look for mutations. Of course, we find lots and lots of mutations. And I, I mentioned in the book, this, this, I can't remember exactly what the number was, 23 million mutations or something that have been associated with, with, with cancer now. Um, and most of them are very, very weak associations. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so there's a kind of a juggernaut, and this happens a, a lot in science, that, that the whole field moves in a particular direction because it can. And then there's a kind of blink of vision. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that there's no genetic involvement in cancer. Of course there is. But the, reason, the main reason why I push back against it a bit is that the biggest single risk factor for cancer is older age. It's an age-related disease, and and by the time you get into your fifties, you, you know, your risk of cancer is is uh, I think a couple of hundred times greater than it, it, it is as as for example an eighteen-year-old, mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to double every decade or so until you're in your eighties. And and um, but but haven't you accumulated you know genetic mutations from the environment during that time? Isn't that the, well, you do, but you just, know, isn't aging not, connected with that? Not obviously enough, and this is this has been ah, in the aging yeah. field for quite a while now. Now, of course, we're also better at detecting mutations now than we were 20 years ago. Uh, but but this has been uh, underpinning a lot of work on on aging as a process over quite a long time, and the mutations just don't seem to build up. And there's all kinds of evidence in cancer that you see very often exactly the same mutations. So things that look like oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes that are mutated. Um, in the surrounding tissue or in other tissues which are not causing cancer there, and hmm. you can change the environment of cells and even, even sometimes changing the electrical properties, for example, of cancers can, can uh, make them go into some form of remission. So there's a, there's a big environmental hmm. context to it. 
Um, and there's an interesting question about aging as a process. What exactly is it? If it's not an accumulation of mutations as we get older, and it's almost right. certainly not, then what actually is it about being older that is, uh, is making diseases like cancer more likely? And the answer is not really so much genetic mutations, so much as you know which genes are switched on and off and why. Hmm. Um, so it's epigenetics more than genetics very often. And epigenetics depends on all kinds of things, um, including, in, including carcinogens that you may have been subjected to and stress and infections. And, uh, but those are all in some sense a little bit random. You, you may or may not have been subjected to them. Um, but the one thing that we're all subjected to uh, is, is a gradual accumulation of damage as we get older. Now, that's a very old and very unsexy idea in biology, the idea that we just get slightly damaged. Um, and, and, and you could argue against it uh, easily enough on the grounds where well, some things live practically forever, so why can't we? Well, everything's had its own kind of evolutionary um, uh, kind of balance, I suppose. How much, what's your expected lifespan? How much do you invest in survival compared to reproduction? Um, and, and so the fact that some things can live forever doesn't mean to say everything's going to live forever. We are, you know, pretty complex things. How much you invest in repairing neurons or repairing heart right. muscle, or whatever it may be, it's a bigger investment than a flatworm would have in repairing its head, which is you know, <laughs> trivial evolutionary expense in comparison. So, so um, the problem is when you have when you have any kind of damage to respiration, and we know for a fact that respiration becomes damaged with age. You can see mm -hmm. the mitochondria decaying effectively. Um, that has tremendous effects on on the way that the Krebs cycle works. It's not just energy generation; it's it's also how how are you building the you know, synthesizing the building blocks of life. And, and they have a, a feed through effect on, on the activity of genes, which genes are switched on and off. And I'm talking thousands of genes being switched mm. on or off. And I think that is really the, 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 the main cause of cancer as we get older. It's not so much that you've accumulated mutations, though they can lock you into a certain state, so much as the, 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 the kind of epigenetic state is different as a result of um, issues with, with mitochondria and, 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 and energy flow and, and um, the synthesis of, you know, e metabolic flux through all of these pathways like the Krebs cycle. Right. So you talked about sort of damage to the, um, uh, to your metabolism, damage to the mi mitochondria, damage to this, to these um, ener energy generating systems. One, one aspect of that, which is a lot in the popular view is the role of free radicals or reactive mm -hmm. oxygen species. Um, is that what's causing the damage? What's the, because that's often what, you know, you see people saying, oh, you know, eat yeah. these antioxidants and it'll yeah. help fight the damage from free well, radicals. It, it doesn't really. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's been, there's been uh, you know, some pretty large studies now over you know, decades uh, of, of what are the effects of taking high doses of antioxidants, right. uh, you know, vitamin E, vitamin C, um, carotenoids and so on, beta carotene. Um, and th there are meta-analyses of these, so looking at the overall statistical weight of, of numerous studies uh, involving uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of patients. And, and the answer that comes across consistently is, if anything, you have a slightly greater risk of dying. It's a very trivial difference, hmm. but it's not, it's not protecting you. Uh, and there's all kinds of reasons for that. But one of the most important reasons, I think, is this, this it's a very graphic idea of free radicals as being violent and, and going mm -hmm. around like kind of hooligans causing, causing you know, smashing up buildings and things. Um, they, they are, they can be reactive, but far more importantly, they play a physiological role. And they're hmm. kept in very narrow bounds and, and they're involved in a lot of signaling. And the trouble with large doses of antioxidants is if, if they ever got anywhere near the, the main source of free radicals in the mitochondria, then they would disrupt all of that signaling and make things hmm. considerably worse. So the reality is we maintain blood levels at, at a pretty consistent level. So if you, if you have a terrible diet and you really don't get any vitamins, then taking some antioxidant supplements is probably a good thing to do. But for most people who have a... A, you know, a reasonably balanced diet, um, they're not really going to help you very much with a few possible exceptions. Did you, um, so if taking antioxidants is not the answer here, 
after doing the research for this book and writing this book, did you actually change any of your own sort of personal health habits or would you make recommendations to others? You said, wow, you know, having healthy mitochondria, it looks like it's really important. I should start doing X. Um, and yes, I realize this uh, is I not mean, a medical advice, you know, yeah, discussion. Yeah, but... <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm not a doctor <laughs> and a, I'm reluctant to give anyone right? any advice, but for, for myself, um, well, I, I think it's a good idea to uh, get exercise. I mean, this is such trivial advice that everybody knows right. it anyway. Everyone says, yeah, e get Eat exercise. your greens and get some exercise. You know, it's, it's really not much more complex than that. It's, it's, um, it's, it's really important not to eat too much and to try and have a balanced diet and to try and, to try and have aerobic exercise, not hmm. overdoing it so that you're stressing the body uh, completely because that, that would be counterproductive. But um, does it work? Yes, I would say there's, there's modest evidence that this is about as beneficial as anything is. Um, there are, you know, purported wonder drugs about to hit the market or on the market already. Um, I've done some work with some of them and, and they can make a difference. Uh, but the trouble, so I'm thinking about nicotinamide riboside, for example, as one which is uh, mm. which, which, which has uh, been around for a few years now and that, that some people swear by. And maybe they work uh, or help. But there's also my own experience in, in, in biology is that it's really difficult to change a complex system it hmm. tends to get kind of it, it tends to find an, a, 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 some kind of long-term setting that it's comfortable with and to change that long-term setting is quite a difficult thing to do um and, and and very often if you see that oh this this wonder drug helps you to live longer my own question is always what's the cost where's the drawback how did you know <laughs> if you try and go for a run now you're gonna have a heart attack and drop dead uh, there's all, uh, one nice example I think was was some someone who put themselves on a calorie restriction diet, and there's good evidence in animals, even rhesus monkeys, that calorie restriction can can help prolong life and and reduce the kind of disease burden with older age. Um, but this guy got such bad osteo, osteoporosis, uh, so his brittle bones that uh, I think he broke both his legs while trying to walk down the street. There's all kinds of things that are almost right. unpredictable as to what the outcome, what the cost, what the downside is going to be. Um, and, and the one thing you can be fairly sure about with, uh, with, with, with modest exercise and a good diet is that, the, that this is as close to being a robust way of improving your health as it's possible to get. But the, the thing is, you need to keep at it. You can't just do it for six months and stop. You need to uh, do it right. over years or decades. Yeah, no, I, lo I love this notion of, of, of your mitochondria and trying to keep them active and keep them, keep them being used is actually the thing that will keep them healthy. Um, mm, it's really true. So um, I have a, since I teach chemistry, I have a pedagogical question for you. So right. I'm gonna, So you show actually a striking number of chemical reactions and chemical mm. structures in the book, for, for, you know, for a book that really is intended for a wide audience. And, but you <laughs> have a really, uh, uh, what I think is a lovely way of presenting. And I just want to share this because I think for folks who don't have the book yet to see this, I think is really interesting. So just here's one little example of this, right? So, you know, showing these molecules, like you, you've, you've chosen a way of representing the molecules that is different from the way we traditionally do in chemistry. And just, just to get a sense of this, um, I'll compare this. So I, you know, here's your way of drawing mm, mm. acetylphosphate, right? Here's, here's me doing it in ChemDraw. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the artistic choices here are interesting. It sort of makes the molecule look like it's alive rather than you know, a, <laughs> a stick figure here. Yeah. And I just wondered about, you know, both your choice to actually show a lot of molecules and reactions and things that feel like, wow, this is chemistry, but actually to do it then in a, in a way that might not, you know, trigger people's unfortunate memories of their, you know, high yeah, school yeah. science classes. So, uh, I mean, I, I think a lot of people have something of a chemistry phobia um, and, and probably seeing the, 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 the chem draw diagrams. I mean, I, I have a PhD <laughs> student at the time who was, I, I originally put them all in chem draw and, and ah, I thought, this, yeah. this is just going to put everybody, I have to do better. I have to draw them myself. And I, you can't believe how long, I, I mean, those were actually done by an artist in the end, but I'd done them all myself first and they were all a bit amateurish and cat-handed, but I basically got what I wanted to convey. 
uh, which, which was a certain friendliness. What I wanted, I wanted people to not look away immediately, but mm-hmm. just to look at it. So I wanted there to be enough um, art in there that it would hold people's attention for long enough to to not panic and run. Right. <laughs> uh, so, so you may say, why do I even want to put them in at all when the high risk is, is that people will panic and run? Um, and the answer is, um, and I think this has become stronger dur- during COVID as well, is I hate preaching at people. Hmm. Um, I, 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 I think there's a real danger with almost a, a kind of priesthood of scientists telling the public what to do. Uh, and I think it's understandable that the public says, you know, <laughs> bog off. Um, no one likes being told what to do. Uh, but I think that there's a big, I think there's a, a large number of people like to understand things and like to be helped to understand things, but 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 don't necessarily want to be told it's this way, just take my word for it. So what I wanted to do with this chemistry was to show, so anybody who who wants to know, and I'm not pretending mm-hmm. that it's necessarily going to be easy or for everybody, but anybody who actually wants to know why is this chemistry so fundamental to life? Why is it that mm-hmm. this Krebs cycle is so central to life and it's really central to the origin of life? Um, what is it about these actual molecules that makes it so likely to happen that way? And, and you, you, really, you have to draw them. There's, you, you can try and describe right. it, and I did, but you lose people very quickly in describing it. And I, in the audio version of the book, uh, obviously, the, the pictures were missing. And, and I ended up rewriting quite a lot to, to take out the pictures and allow the text to flow still, um, even, even, even without the pictures. And in, in one way, uh, the text was better for it because it, it, it then flowed better as pure text. But mm-hmm. in another sense, I really think there's a lot missing from not seeing the pictures. And I wanted the pictures to be beautiful enough that people would just linger and, and look at them and think about it. And so I wanted the bonds to look different than just sticks or something. Yeah. Uh, so and I, I'd like to, I think it works. Uh, it's not going to work for everybody. Nothing you do is going to please everybody. But it was my own attempt to try to make the molecules themselves the heroes of the book and, and, and make people want to know why is this chemistry happening this way? I mean, you know, you, as, as you know, you're, you're into quantum mechanics pretty quickly. With this yes, stuff, right. And yeah. I'm not a quantum mechanicist, but, uh, you know, I, it's, it's something that I can't get away from because it's just so fundamental to how things work. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the, the origin of life. Yeah. And, you know, so this is actually something that we talk about in the class that in the class that I teach with my colleagues. Um, and, you know, the, the, the story that we tell there is this sort of RNA world story mm. where, you know, you can get prebiotic synthesis of RNA building blocks and they can come together, get encapsulated in some protocells. And then you start then you have heredity, yeah. some kind of replication and then natural selection and you're off to the races. And um, you know, obviously that story has left metabolism out of the picture. And I, and I wonder, is your, tell us your sort of story, if you have a, you know, story of what yes. the origin of life yeah, might be. Yeah. That, that... Well, uh, I, I, I mean, all the steps you've just talked about are obviously important, but I would put them in a different order. Okay. Um, and, and I have a, a lot of personal problems with, with uh, a kind of a pure RNA world that invents metabolism and invent cells and, and so effectively information comes first and where right. do all the where do all the nucleotides come from that make up the rna for for the rna world well you know the assumption is it's not an assumption this is chemistry that's being done in the lab uh, but starting with things like cyanide and cyanoacetylene and, and right. uv radiation and so on um, so it's good chemistry done by very good chemists and and it works um, but it doesn't look anything like life itself and it, it, it's so there's this, this question about, well, how do you then get to life? And the assumption is, mm-hmm. well, first of all, you have an RNA world and that invents metabolism. But there's a lot of problems with that view as well. And people have been experimenting on the RNA world over decades now. And, and it can do some things. But again, it, it, there's a lot that's wrong with it that just doesn't really hang together. And there's also mm-hmm. interesting questions about how do whole biochemical pathways where you may have 10 or 12 steps where you have a, an enzyme or a biological catalyst uh, controlling each of the steps, catalyzing each of the steps. Um, 
So, so if you effectively, if, 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 if RNA or DNA, if gene invents one of those enzymes, then what use is it in isolation? Uh, and there are various attempts to get around that problem, but it basically works much better if you assume that most of this chemistry can happen spontaneously. Hmm. Now that has a big ask as well, which is that <laughs> the whole of core metabolism, starting with carbon dioxide and hydrogen can just spontaneously happen in the right con conditions. And I would say six or seven years ago, uh, that was a very hand wavy statement. Hmm. It's still somewhat hand wavy, but since then, uh, a lot of it has been done in the lab. Um, hmm. We're talking, it's not all of it and it's not necessarily whole pathways, but it's substantial parts of these pathways. It's not always going in the direction you'd want it to go in. It goes backwards or sometimes forwards. It, but um, the, the thing is, there's something favored about the molecules themselves. And especially when you're starting with carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Uh, and some of my own work has shown that the way that cells drive this reaction is with these electrical charges on membranes. And, and if you have a, similar things in a purely inorganic system, so effectively pores in hydrothermal vents, that drives this same chemistry to make the Krebs cycle intermediate. So there's kind of combinations of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, and, and from, you know, we've succeeded in making. Um, Uracil, for example, one of the pyrimidine mm -hmm. uh, bases. Uh, another group published it right before us, and we'll we'll publish ours shortly. But uh, you know, this was all assumed or considered to be impossible, and will still be dismissed mm. as by some chemists as just you know <laughs> not possible. But it is, and it works. Uh, and so we've come a long way from from this being theory to this being real chemistry that happens in the lab. It's still a long way to go to show that all the metabolism is going to join up that way. But if it's successful, um, then what you end up with is effectively energy coming first, driving, driving carbon dioxide fixation to make initially protocells with, mm -hmm. with fatty acid membranes that are capable of growing themselves. Uh, again, using these same gradients. So the whole thing is driven by disequilibria in the environment and, uh, and the reaction between hydrogen and CO2 to make these organic molecules by way of the Krebs cycle. Um, and then but, when, but you, when you introduce RNA into that world, yeah. um, and again, you need to get the nucleotides, you need to concentrate them, you need to join them up. There's a lot to be done here still. But when if you've got effectively a population of growing protocells and you mm. introduce RNA into that, then, then information has meaning from the very beginning because it's influencing protocell growth. So it's not being introduced into a void very unlike the, the the kind of the naked RNA world where it's very difficult to work out how, how does this information arise. Right. Right. So the so the early protocell would have metabolism, but would not actually have yes. a, a hereditary mechanism or information carrying mechanism. Well, it has say. it it can have hereditary mechanisms, just not genes. So there's ah, okay. such a thing as membrane, membrane heredity. Uh, and now what membrane heredity is, is in effect if you if 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 things go to a membrane, and this still happens in modern cells. Uh, what is physically passed on is is mm. the membrane itself. If a cell divides in two, both cells get you know half get the some membrane. of the membrane. Yeah, yeah. And if that membrane is effectively attracting things to itself, and and here I'm thinking uh, about short peptides, for example, that are hydrophobic, or I'm thinking about iron sulfur clusters that are driving CO2 fixation. Um, then the daughter cell effectively gets the machinery to to uh, drive its own growth. So it's the genotype and the phenotype are the same thing. Now you can also think it's slightly less direct connection, but you can think the same way for metabolism as well. If metabolism really is, if there's a strong enough driving force, which is capable of giving rise to a spontaneous proto metabolism um, and the daughter cells get that driving force, then they will reconstitute that metabolism and pass it on to their own daughter mm -hmm. cells. So you, th th there are hereditary mechanisms that are basically uh, working on positive feedback loops or autocatalysis, um, and and it 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 works <laughs> in silico, and some of it works in in the lab, um, and there's a lot to do still, um, but it's exciting, and and I, I you know I feel as if we are making progress with these ideas, having gone from ten years ago uh, with very little actual lab evidence that any of it could happen, through to now really quite a, a, a good body of work that says this is not a stupid approach. Right. No, that's, that's fascinating. Um, so I think, 
uh, we may be coming close to a time when we should probably start opening this up for questions. Um, yeah. Uh, Benjamin, do you um, do you want to invite audience questions now? Yeah, very happy to. So we just have a few. Um, so everyone feel free to submit more. But we have two very good questions from Andy Nirenberg in the audience, who sounds like he is <laughs> very familiar with the topic of today's book. So I'll start off with this one question, um, just looking for a little bit of clarification on exercise. So Andy asks, how do you understand the multiple pathways affected by exercise? Uh, well, very good question. I mean, I, it, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> the, 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 the work that I do on this myself is in fruit flies. Uh, and, and it's, um, I'm, I'm pretty stretched in, in the lab between some work on mitochondria and fruit flies and some, some theoretical work on, 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 on genetics and, and, and then this experimental stuff on the origin of life. But in the fruit flies, what we're looking at are, are flies that have, have got a, a genetically identical background. So the, the nuclear genes are the same in, in these different fly lines, but the mitochondrial genes are, are from different populations. There are no mutations there. They're simply um, a, a genome from a population. But what that means is we can, um, we, we can look at the physiology and we know that the only effects are, are potentially incompatibilities between the genes in the mitochondria and, and the genes in the nucleus. But because the genes in the nucleus are always the same, then we've limited that, you know, we've focused down on, on what's happening in the mitochondria. And what that allows us to do is look at how changes in respiration affect metabolic flux and gene expression. And what that allows us to do, because if you, if you simply do exercise, for example, then you can see all kinds of things shifting, but how do you know which bit of the exercise or which bit of anything uh, led to the changes that you see. There's so many pathways and so many things that can change that how do you know <laughs> which bit of it? Is it a stress response, for example, that cleans things up? What, 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 are, what are the aspects that do it? So the, the nice thing about the fly model is that it allows you to pinpoint one particular starting place, which is linked to the mitochondria. And then you know all the downstream changes come from that and nowhere else. Um, and that begins to allow you to quantify what kind of changes you have depending on the quality of your mitochondria. So how, for example, if you, so we, we see uh, the, the, the different fly lines genetically identical in the nuclear genes, uh, but, but different in the mitochondrial genes with no mutations, just differences in, 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 in the genome. Um, some of them are far more active um, and, and uh, effectively move around much more and are physically much more able than, than others. Uh, they're often more fertile as well um, and, and often longer lived. So we know that there are configurations there that are capable of effectively giving long lifespan, good health and good physical activity. And there are others which do the opposite. Um, and so the question is, well, can we do anything about that? Are, are there ways that we can interfere with these processes and effectively improve the ones that aren't working so well? And, and again, this, this model allows us to get at the, the moving parts to try and work out well, does this work? So one of the things we are looking at in there is, is, is this nicotinamide riboside therapy to work out, are, are, do, does it improve things across the board or does it depend on uh, your, your mitonuclear interactions? So Andy also asks about nicotinamide riboside. So okay. um, yeah, so we, you're studying the effects of nicotinamide riboside on energy metabolism in the brain. I would love to hear more of your thoughts, he asks. <laughs> okay, well, I, I'll, give my, um, I'll give my central thought. Um, so, so a lot of what the book is about is how is the Krebs cycle spinning? Which direction is it going to spin in? Mm -hmm. And in cancer, for example, parts of it will, will go into reverse. Now, what nicotinamide riboside is doing is increasing the size of the NAD pool. Uh, now, NAD for <laughs> any normal person, uh, it basically, I, I've talked about the, the Krebs cycle is, is taking hydrogen out from, from, from the intermediates, from the food molecules, if you like, and it's passing them into respiration. They're being burnt in oxygen, but it's passing them specifically into one big protein complex sitting in the mitochondrial membrane called complex one. And they're all going in there from this thing called NADH, which is the, the version of NAD that's got hydrogen stuck to it. So the hydrogen that's coming out of the Krebs cycle goes on to NADH and then into complex one uh, in, in respiration. Now, 
as we get older, we, we seem to get a specific problem with complex one. The activity of complex one goes down. There are ways around that in terms of energy generation. We can feed electrons into other bits of respiration and, and you can have almost equally good respiration anyway. But the Krebs cycle is not going to spin in the same way because the, the NADH is not going to be oxidized. So the issue to me with, with NR is that if we increase the overall size of the pool uh, of NR, then and, and we can't oxidize it properly in the mitochondria, then we're going to potentially have some drift towards a changed, what we should call a redox state, but effectively the balance between NADH and NAD shifts towards more NADH. And that could have all kinds of knock-on effects on gene expression. So this could happen with NR, but doesn't seem to. Hmm. So the question is, why not? And, and the answer, and this is very preliminary data, which I probably shouldn't talk about at all, but uh, with NR, we're seeing an increase in, in, in complex one activity. And I don't know how that's happening at the moment, hmm. um, but it's something which is something like that has to happen if NR is going to work. And it does seem as if it does happen, but then I don't know, does it happen in all these different fly lines? Does it, what, how is it happening? There's all kinds of interesting questions there. Um, and there's bound to be with all of these things, there, you know, there are reasons why things are the way they are, uh, to my mind, very often, some people might dispute that, but but uh, usually, there is a balance to a system. And if you disrupt that balance, then there is some kind of penalty likely to be paid somewhere. Uh, and, and I think any of these treatments that could become enormously popular if they work very well, um, we, we also need to know, is there a risk of a downside that uh, people weren't, weren't looking for? I don't know if that answers the question. I hope so. <laughs> it definitely seems to. Sorry, I'm actually just the, the Q&A has been sort of buzzing with a discussion of NR. Um, biologists, right. non-biologists asking questions. Um, we have a question from Richard Alpert, who also chimed in about NR, um, who also uh, wants to know if nicotinamide mononucleotide is is comes up in your research at all as well as uh, it's yes uh, related. it's more it's more biologically active and available um and there there, there is uh, i mean there are companies who are working on that uh, and i i've been partially involved in in that and we're about to start some experiments ourselves it it should be better than nr itself um, but then all of the potential side effects that NR could could, that could cause if mm -hmm. if NMN is it, it really does kind of ramp up the whole system uh, and that's the hope I think uh, then it would also ramp up the possibility of side effects which is why we're interested in looking to see what, what what's the reality of this. Wonderful. So that uh, at least. For the time being is all of the audience questions we have. Um, we're almost at time, so I just do want to give both of you an opportunity to sort of ask any last minute questions or kind of speak to the book a little bit more. So anything you want to sort of close out with, Logan? Yeah, let me ask. Um, I think one of the most interesting um, bits in the book was right at the end when you talk about, you know, can we learn anything about consciousness? Um, and um, mm. uh, uh, I loved this notion that you sort of said, well, we don't really know much about consciousness, but we know that if we put you under ether or, you know, mm -hmm. xenon or something that we can make you unconscious. So there's actually a, you know, uh, an experimental test that we can do in some sense to probe consciousness. Tell us a little bit about that, which is obviously speculative, but I thought was a wonderful way that you closed the book. Yes, it, obviously it's speculative, and and everybody has a different view of what they mean by consciousness. And I'm not, yes, of course. Uh, I'm not trying to explain all of consciousness, but the, I think the, 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 it's often called the hard problem. Um, but as a biochemist, to me, it's the most interesting aspect of it because it's very easy for me to imagine that a complex kind of parallel processing system is going to be capable of great feats of computation. Um, right. But perhaps the, including self-awareness that that could emerge from such a I would imagine that self-awareness yeah. I, I would imagine so so I'm not yeah. thinking especially about self-awareness I mean there, there has to be I suppose with a certain level of complexity an awareness that uh, the thing which is which is which is moving is you and therefore right. <laughs> and yeah. this develops quite early I think maybe well by the age of two or three or something I'm not an expert on this we see it in 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 great apes um possibly even in things like the octopus 
Um, mm -hmm. But it's not it's not everywhere, though. You know, there's, there's a very nice example that Derek Denton gives um, of a fox that has its um, its leg trapped in a, in 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 um, in, in a, 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 a a trap and mm -hmm. um, and and gnaws off its own leg. And and what that says is that it's it's kind of aware of itself. It's aware of its limbs. It's aware that it's trapped, and it's a, it's got an escape plan, which is a terrible mm -hmm. one, which is to gnaw off its own leg. But it, it you know it knows that it can escape from that trap if it does so. So there's a lot of I think self awareness implicit in that, and no right. doubt some people would disagree. But it seems you know the the common sense interpretation includes most of that. So I think where the the interest for me is 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 is, is what uh, is a feeling in physical terms, hmm. uh, qualia, as, as, as people talk about them. But um, and and I, I wrote about this in a, in a, in an earlier book, Life Ascending, twelve years ago, and thirteen years ago, and um, never really came to any kind of conclusion for myself. Um, I, I kind of covered what was talked about in the field, and I didn't find out any of the solutions particularly satisfying to me. Mm -hmm. um and um I, I kind of left it there until coming across the, the the quotes that you mentioned came from Luca Turin uh, yeah. who had shown that that uh that xenon which is an inert gas is capable of of um of of anesthesia general anesthesia and uh, and he had shown that uh volatile anesthetics including xenon uh, interfere with the transfer of electrons to oxygen in respiration. Mm. And so that suddenly placed uh, respiration kind of front and central. It doesn't prove causality, um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's not really doing very much else. Any, anything to do with consciousness is bound to be supported by energy flow and respiration. So you can't prove that uh, right. that's causal. But there's a possibility that it is. Now, the structure of mitochondria we know a lot more about now than we did 10 years ago and and they're much more closed systems than we'd realized and doug wallace for a while and other people as well have been thinking about electric electromagnetic fields generated by um, mitochondria we've known a long time about electrostatic fields with the membrane potential mm -hmm. across yeah. and, and they are probably important but now we have a structure with effectively an oscillating flux of protons um, in parallel christie which are in principle capable of generating uh, reinforcing electromagnetic fields mm -hmm. and we don't really know is the EEG only about depolarization of the cell membrane the plasma membrane or could mitochondrial fields be involved in that as well it's very clear that electromagnetic fields play a role in consciousness and there's a possibility that some of them are coming from the mitochondria so I finished the book with this question well why if that were the case right. why might why some bit inside a cell and, and the answer is that, well, bacteria, sorry, mitochondria were bacteria once, pre-living right. bacteria. And this charge is then the charge on their plasma membrane. It's the membrane which is separating the inside of the bacterium from the outside world. And all of this metabolism that's happening inside cells, you know, billion, a billion reactions a second or, 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 or even more than that, um, across and the molecules are orders of magnitude smaller than the cell itself. And so what's integrating all of this <laughs> molecular machinery in space? If we were to shrink ourselves down to mm. the size of a molecule, then 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 the cell is you know a city like New York or or Boston or or London or something. It's a, it's, a, it's a large city. So what is integrating all of these individual moving parts as as part of a an entity? Now, a lot of them are linked in through the Krebs cycle because the Krebs cycle is so central to all this metabolism. If that's not spinning, mm -hmm. then nothing else is going to be happening. And the Krebs cycle is linked to the electrical field on uh, the electrical potential on the membrane. Uh, and, and, and so this has a, a kind of a unifying effect across the entire cell that it's going mm. to control or reflect all of metabolism. And it's not only generating an electrostatic field, it's probably going to be generating electromagnetic fields as well. Um, and, and, and this is going to affect the behavior of molecules in, you know, trapped in certain oscillation states, for example. So how does a bacterium know what's out there in the world? As, you know, we're going from, let's say, objective things, <laughs> poisons or lack of oxygen or whatever it may be out, out in the world. And there's a cell membrane, which is, in one way or another, it's being called a Markov blanket, for example, by Carl Friston, 
uh, and Mark Solms, but th this idea that that what a cell needs to know about the outside world is translated into the subjective language of biochemistry, you might say. Mm -hmm. It's a different language and it's necessarily subjective. Um, and, and it's integrated by the real-time feedback by the fields on the, on the membrane, which is separating the inside of the cell from the outside world. So what's natural selection going to act on in the very, very first steps of consciousness? I, mean, I imagine a bacterium is capable of thinking, I'm all right, or it's shit here. You know, that kind of, that, that level of processing uh, and, 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 and will either leave or stay or, you know, yeah. move, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not saying they're kind of aware of themselves or conscious in a way that we would recognize, but they, they have behavior as an entity, as a cell. And I think that that mm -hmm. can be integrated by electrical fields, uh, which are necessarily generated by metabolism, the way that the cell is structured, that this goes right back to the very beginnings of life. And that as we fashion um, in development, a lot of the work from Michael Lynch, for example, showing the importance of electrical fields during during development of flatworms mm -hmm. and, and, and mm -hmm. tadpoles and all kinds of things like that, probably us too. Um, and then eventually the central nervous system and, and this enormous elaboration of how a field's then working, but we're still dealing with with uh, an implicit internal subjective language of what it feels like to the system. So. It's a speculative ending to the book, but I think it's uh, they're, they're, I, th I find them rather beautiful thoughts. Uh, they, they, they may be true. That's one of the nicest things about science. Maybe we'd leave it on that note. <laughs> yeah, it may be true. The ideas that of things that might be true and which you can imagine ways of testing them. And I can imagine some ways of testing this and the I thrill know. of the possibility that it might be like this is one of the big driving forces in science. And it's, it's a great possibility and it may be completely wrong, in which case, hey, well, <laughs> right. another day in the lab. Right. No, that's great. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Great. I think the realm of possibility is a great place to end. Um, <clears throat> any closing thoughts before uh, we, we end the program? I think I've probably ended where I ought to end. Awesome. Yes. I think we're <laughs> okay. I think we're done. Perfect. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you once again to Nick and Logan for this fantastic conversation. Thanks to all of you out there for spending part of your afternoon with us. Please learn more about this book and purchase Transformer at harvard.com. Harvard on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Enjoy the rest of your day. Keep reading and be well. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks.